Hi, I'm Sally Russell. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Hick Talks. Welcome to Helsingborg. This is a podcast series in English designed to demystify the city of Helsingborg for its international residents. In this episode, we talk to Michael McEnany of the International School of Helsingborg, one of the few schools in Sweden which takes students from preschool to the end of upper secondary education. Hi, Michael. Thanks very much for joining us today. Pleasure to be with you, Sally. It's lovely to catch up with you. Really pleased that you're able to speak with us because we get lots of questions about the international school and I know how popular it is. Hopefully you'll be able to answer some of those questions and let more people know about the school. And I should also explain while we're talking right now that I've been very closely connected with the school for many years. I was a parent starting in 2008 and a substitute teacher. Also uh, was the PTA chair for four years and then worked as a school librarian. And you were my boss at the time. So it's great to have you back. Yeah, and I I thank you, Sally, for your years of service to the school. You were (laughs) a very active member of the community. And yeah, we missed that level of engagement. So thanks. Thank you. Well, in my heart, I'm still at the school. So (laughs) yeah. (laughs) But we do get a lot of questions through Hick about the school. So as I say, it's a really nice opportunity to have you here. So thank you for that. So first of all, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Have you lived in Sweden for long? Uh, Yes, I'm approaching my eighth year in Sweden. So, and I've been working at the school from from actually from my, when I very first arrived. I think I arrived in Sweden on New Year's Day, and seven or eight days later, I started working on the in school after the Christmas holidays had ended. Right. In fact, I think I remember meeting you early on because didn't you come as either a substitute or temporary cover right. for someone? Yeah, that, that's yeah. correct. It's been a journey for me personally, and nothing that I expected or anticipated so you know it just goes to show you don't know what life's got in store no exactly and that leads nicely into our next question which is what's your role at the school so my role at the school is I have the title head of school so in the Swedish schooling system each school must have a rector or a principal so that's my role but I'm also the assistant principal if you like and leader of the diploma program so I have I have a dual role okay and how long has the international school been in Helsingborg? Uh, you probably know the history better than me, Sally. But the school has been in existence since 1995. Mm. And I guess its primary aim is to serve the international community of Helsingborg and the surrounding area. So the school's function, of course, would go hand in hand with the city's goal and, and the, the goal that the city has for 2035 to be a global city. It fits in quite well to that. We are here to make it possible for the international companies, the Swedish companies that are operating in this area to bring their families here so that there's a school place for their children. They can take those job opportunities and hopefully that those companies can develop and and find good employees. Yeah, no, and I think that's actually a great answer too, because that reminds me that we wouldn't have come to Sweden if we hadn't had this opportunity of bringing our kids to an international school. It was was remarkable to find out that it was actually a state school and that, you know, we were eligible. In an ideal world, I'd have also arranged interviews with the heads of the other two schools that we've got in Helsingborg now because we've also got the International English School and Dibber which is now an international school too so I just wanted to to mention them it's been nice to be able to ask you today because I know that you encompass the whole range the age range of, of students at school so that's ideal so how many students are there at the school now I know it's grown enormously over the years Yeah, it has been. Since I first started working as a school leader here, which was 2015, I went back and checked some old documents. And at that time, we had around 550 students, whereas today we're somewhere around, I mean, it fluctuates, but we're around 830 students today. Yes. Yeah. And that that ranges from two years old to 19. And actually, it's just from this year that we're from August that we now take two-year-olds. So we do now take children who are still in diapers into our our preschool a a limited number there is demand and we have started that as of last month okay that's interesting you say that because I did notice that a friend of mine had her two-year-old at the school and I, I was trying to work that out so obviously that that's really new fantastic 
Thank you. Okay, so also, I'm, I love this question because I'm always interested to know, do you know how many countries are represented at the school? Well, I have an answer for you. <laughs> of course, that's something that can change on a termly basis. But the last time we were as an IB school, we are evaluated in a, in a five-year cycle by mm. the IO. And the last time we were evaluated, we have to generate a lot of this data. So I can tell you that at least in the end of 2018 into 2019, we had 36 countries represented mm. by students and staff. OK, thank you. That's, it's always good to know. One thing I'm often asked about through HIC is the criteria for attending the school. So the question is, can anyone enrol their children? Is there a long waiting list? And for example, what about siblings? Do they have priority at all when uh, people are trying to, to register for the school? Yeah, I'll try to answer. There's kind of three mm, questions. Yeah. So I think, as you mentioned already, we are a public school. We are not a private school. So we are financed by the public taxpayers' money. And we also follow in relation to entry requirements to our school. That is governed by a chapter in the Swedish school law. So though the entry requirements are set in law, they're documented, and all international schools in Sweden follow that. And it's just worth pointing out that that is one thing that differentiates us between Engelska Skolan and Dibber, in that the easiest way to describe it is they are Swedish schools offering a kind of international aspect to their schooling. In Dibber's case, they are offering IB programme. In Engelska Skolan's case, they're offering some of their subjects taught in English. So the entry requirements that we have do not apply to those two schools. Mm -hmm. might, that might that may be important for your your watchers and listeners to know. Yeah. So as I said, the entry requirements are governed by law. To summarize just quickly, the main entry requirements are number one, an international family that's moving to Sweden for a temporary work assignment. Mm. So they have a legal right to a place in an international school like ours. Yeah. Uh, they can be here to work. They can also be here to study. We have some families where a parent is here studying maybe a two years master's in Lundford. Mm, mm, yeah. Next on the list, we have Swedish families who will have an upcoming assignment overseas. So a Swedish family that maybe is, they work for IKEA, but IKEA wants them to work in the IKEA office in China, for example. Mm. They have a right to enroll their child in an international school in Sweden before they leave to prepare that student for being taught in English, being in that environment when they would move to China in that case. Right. And then an addition was made to the law in 2016, mm. which also means families that have at least one parent who's a native English speaker, they also have a right to apply for a place here. Mm -hmm. And okay. the reality is for us now, which moves into your second question about places, we are oversubscribed in many, many of our grade levels. Mm -hmm. We have a there's a demand that we cannot meet with the space that we have. So for those listening, that would be particularly for grade levels in PYP and MYP, where we are more or less at our maximum. Yeah. yeah. So that has led to us to having to prioritize the places. So top of the pile are those that are coming in from overseas because they don't really have any other schooling options. Exactly. Yeah. So, so unfortunately, that is how it is at the moment. And it, yeah. leads, it leads to people being disappointed. I can say that we're disappointed. Mm. We, mm. You would be able to offer places to everyone who has the right to a place. Yeah. Uh, but th yeah. this is the position that we find ourselves in at the moment. Sounds like you need a bigger school. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. that, that, yeah. that would be the dream, Sally. I can imagine. Yeah. Lovely. OK. And we just have that little question at the end as well about siblings. So, for example, if one child has already been at the school and they have a younger sibling coming along, is there any kind of priority for them? We don't have the sibling rule, as in there's a sibling rule in the Swedish schooling system. But we our endeavour is always to get the whole family into the school. Yeah. But I must say that that has become more challenging as we have shortage of places. Mm. So. We do often find ourselves in the position now where a family applies, they have two children, 
we have place for one, we don't have room for the other. Mm. I understand for families that is really difficult. Yeah, it's difficult, and isn't it? If I could just add there, are, I mean, my recommendation always is, you know, the earlier you apply, mm. the better the chance that we can, you know, provide what you would like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, late, late applications, particularly when the school year has started, we just don't have that flexibility anymore. Yeah, lovely. So I had a question here about whether Ish is one of the few international schools in Sweden to cater for all age groups. Do you know, is that correct? I remember hearing a long time ago that there were very few. That's correct. Mm. That is, there, there are 37 schools in total in Sweden that offer at least one IB programme. Most of those schools are high schools that offer the diploma. So there are, there are many schools that only offer that program. And then there are three schools that offer the primary years, the middle years and the diploma. That's ourselves. That's mm. the International School of Stockholm region. Yeah. And that's also Bladins in Malmö. OK, good. Thank you. And um, I think we've covered this already, but we talked about the fact that people often think that Ish is a private school. And it's surprising how many people have that assumption. And is there anything else you'd like to clarify? I have reflected on this a fair bit over the years. And I can tell you that even when I would meet school leader colleagues in the wider context in Helsingborg Stad, sometimes they're even confused on that. Yeah. I'm, I'm not really sure, Sally, where it comes from. <laughs> Uh, it's still a bit of a mystery to me Uh, (laughs) of course I can understand that in the global context international schools tend to be private yes exactly yeah so that part is understandable but I'm always keen and proud to say that we're a public school and we offer a high quality education as a public school yeah yeah thank you fantastic So can you let me know how the school is structured? For example, I know you've got the different programmes and you're in a few different locations now. Would you perhaps just like to explain that a little bit? Sure. We'll start with the preschool, the early years programme. And the early years is not a separate IB programme. We call it early years to indicate the age of the children. But in the IB context, early years is part of the PYP. Our early years programme moved to new premises last August, August 2020. Mm. So we're now located in Fredriksdal area, if the listeners know where Quebec school land is. Right. We were really happy to get those premises there. They had been recently converted and adapted to be preschool premises. So we were really happy to get those. And we've just expanded the second floor in the building. And we actually have our official opening on the 20th of September. Oh, good. Yeah. So all, all early years, parents and families are welcome to come along to the opening. Right. That's been a really great step forward for the school to have those premises tailor-made for children from yes. two to five. The downside, of course, is as a whole organisation, it breaks us up. Mm. Uh, but that's the trade-off, I'm afraid. Yeah. We yeah. feel that this is better quality for our students. And then we have the PYP, which exclusively now has our PYP campus, which is, as you mentioned, is beside the hospital on Valgatan. Mm. Yeah. So that building now is housing around 390 PYP1 to PYP6 students and free right. teams. Good. So PYP there just opposite the hospital on Westerwaldgarten on that side. And then you've got MYP is sort of the other side of the hospital, isn't it? Around yes. the corner. Mm. So both MYP and Diploma now find themselves in the area of the Nikolai School. Yes. So we have two sections of that campus, if you like, one part for MYP and the other for DP. I mean, DP has been here for many years. MYP moved in 2018 to those Mm. premises because of the demand for space in the PYP. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So ISH follows the IB programme, the International Baccalaureate, which not everyone might be familiar with. Could you tell us something about that, please? Yeah, the IB, I think, is a wonderful thing. For those that don't know, I mean, it's an international organisation. You can find IB schools in over 140 countries worldwide. And what connects us all together really is the mission and vision of the IB, Mm. which very simply put is education for a better world. 
Yeah. What, what we're about is building citizens of the future, people who can really understand this world and more importantly, look after it and contribute to its development. I mean, these are lofty ambitions that we have, but th that is our focus. And when it comes to the curriculum, this can be what is maybe for some of our families, depending on the national system that they're moving from, this can be the biggest difference for them because it isn't like a traditional education system in the sense that not everything is focused on knowledge and learning facts and being able to regurgitate those. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we're creating the whole student where they learn knowledge, but it's what they do with it. How do they communicate it? Yeah. How do they investigate it? How, yeah. do they how do they critically evaluate knowledge? Yes. Yeah. The, these are the, the young learners that the IB program, its mission is to develop young learners like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I completely agree. And I always remember sort of hearing from the start that you know, they're looking at the whole student as well. And I think that's incredibly important. And what you just touched on there about being able to understand sources, how to research sources and keep an open mind. I think the IB students are wonderfully open minded. And I think one of the pleasures of working at the school was seeing so many different nationalities, religions, etc., coming together and sitting, absorbing ideas, but also then going off and exploring for themselves. And I can remember always being so impressed by the PYP6 exhibition. Those students are only 11 years old, something like that. And yet they work in groups and go off and spend probably the best part of a term, I think, working on something and researching something and then presenting it. And I think the confidence that you see in those students is really brought about by that system. I mean, it can be a shared uh, student-centred learning, but I really believe that that's what the IB delivers. Thinking mm. of the whole student, keeping the student in the centre all the time of, of decisions that are made, actions that we take. I mean, I really believe that the IB achieves that. Mm. And I've heard so many times from young people who have gone off to university, and they all say that after the IB, they feel so well prepared in that first year. And they feel that it's noticeable that other students who have been through other systems perhaps don't have the same tools or the same aptitude for their own research and that kind of thing. So I think that's a real, a real testament. Yeah. The diploma programme, it's very testing, but it does a great job to prepare students for further mm -hmm. education. And if I take this year as an example, where we had our best ever DP results, one student is going to university in Korea. There's another student going to university in Japan. And, you know, I think on one hand, I'm a little bit jealous. That would be a wonderful <laughs> experience, but also proud knowing that, well, the, how this program is constructed to think beyond the boundaries of this country. I mean, for me, that their minds are open for those experiences yeah. and to seek yeah. out those experiences. And I think that's, yeah, I mean, then, then you can feel job is done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can be very proud of that, I think. And yes, congratulations. I did hear that you had some excellent results this year. You said they were the best ever. They were our best ever results. And in the context of the pandemic, yeah. it's something to be even more proud of. Yeah. So the IB give schools globally the option to either take exams or mm. go down another route, which is that all work is assessed and then submitted to the IB for checking. Yeah. Well, we, we went down the exam route. We were okay. we were safely able to deliver exams with the COVID restrictions. Mm. We didn't have any cases or anybody sick during the exam, so we, which I feel very fortunate for. Yeah. And the students really, we just feel so happy that they got the chance to show what they know in that setting. Yes. Uh, and in the end, uh, the school's best ever results. Wonderful. I'm really happy for you. I think that's fantastic. So how do you see the future for the school? Well, uh, connected still maybe to the pandemic. For me, I'm really interested to see how the world is going to change post-pandemic, which, depending on what happens, that could have big implications for the school, I think. Mm. If you just think, for example, people working from home, if that becomes the new norm, will international families need to move to Sweden to work for company X anymore? Yes. So yeah. that, 
that feels like a little bit of an unknown and that will probably take a little bit more time to play yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, of course, during this period, there hasn't been the same movement of our families, families that are already here and in the school haven't had the same options to move or to take a new opportunity during the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. So I must admit, I feel there's a lot of uncertainty, actually, mm. Mm. Uh, on, how, on how the world will really change. Right. Because I think we all know that it is it already has changed. And yeah. to some extent, it's not going to go back. So what does that mean for our school? That mm. is a that's a question mark, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in terms of where we stand at the moment, I mean, for us, it's always about building on quality. We are not a school that ever thinks that's good enough. We always look for how can we improve? How can yeah. we make it better for our students? How can we make it better for our families? And you will appreciate this, that, of course, during the pandemic, it has been impossible to run any of our PTA events. Yes. Yeah. Although we have a full membership of a PTA at the moment. Mm. We're restricted in, you know, building the community that has suffered. So definitely in the future, that's something we want to reinvest our time in. Yeah, again. yeah no, I can understand that. And it's, it's been the same for us with Hick, you know, having virtually no physical events for a long time. We just had a few things last summer, which were great. And then a few hybrid events in the autumn. And then it's only really the summer that we've just started up picking up physical events again. And people are just so thrilled to, to see each other and to do something. So it has been good. So, Michael, one question I get asked quite often is, how does it work if a family decides to stay in Sweden for longer than they were originally? expecting for example if a child is coming to the end of PYPs and families are starting to wonder is it a good thing for their child to stay in the international school if they're going to be here long term or would it be better for them to switch into the Swedish system so that then they can already be getting the grades at a later stage to go into the Swedish program afterwards what do you think about that? That's a really good question. And it's something that comes up quite often. Mm. And I think it's really good that you're getting questions like that. And I encourage all families in this position to really think about this, especially in those, you know, at the end of PYP, when, of course, it's a more natural time to make a transition to a different school. I think for families, it can be difficult if you come here temporarily and all of a sudden temporarily has become five years Mm. and your kids are getting older and maybe you're still not sure about what the future is going to be. It's a really hard question. But what I see more and more are students reaching MYP4, which is grade nine in the Swedish system, and that's the end of compulsory school. Mm -hmm. And maybe having that moment where they're thinking, ah, there's other programs than the diploma that actually would be really good for me. Yeah. And then they see that and then suddenly realize, but my Swedish language isn't in a place where I could be accepted onto that program or be able to be successful. So I really do recommend that families think hard about this and it can Mm -hmm. be difficult because it's hard to have that crystal ball for the future. Yeah. But I mean, it it is worth noting that I guess the objective of our school is not really to prepare students for Swedish speaking high school. Mm, mm. And we, you know, if we go back to the entry requirements of the school, everything is kind of framed around being here on a temporary basis. Yes. So if a family decides that, no, this is our home now and that is great to make Sweden your home, then that, I think, is the next question to take. And I recommend families talk to the school. You can talk to our careers guidance counsellor. Even at the PYP stage, we can help to guide there. Uh, But ultimately, it's a family decision. And the best that we can do is just, you know, inform of that, that this is how things are today. But maybe in five years time, you will want something else. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So our objective really, Sally, is to help to inform when families make those decisions but each year now more than probably i've experienced in the past more families are choosing to transition at the end Mm. of p6 and that to me of course that makes complete sense 
Yeah, yeah. And for students who are still at ISH at the end of MYP4, are the grades that they get in MYP4 sufficient? Let's say they have enough Swedish already. So if the language side is okay, are there any issues with the grades that they'll receive in MYP4 if they want to go into a Swedish programme at that stage? Well, I mean, we've been doing this for, this will be the fifth year where we haven't provided Swedish grades and haven't followed the Swedish curriculum. Yeah. And I mean, our students, I mean, we've worked hard to inform. We have materials prepared that we share with the other high schools right. so that, that they understand our grading system, mm-hmm. so that they can properly interpret the grades that they're receiving. And that is done through Antogningen or the admissions centre. So, I mean, our students that are leaving with top grades, MYP grades, are getting into the other high schools. So there's no issue, X. I know that that's a concern sometimes for people. Yeah. And actually, while we're on the same subject, uh, I've had the same kind of question about going into Swedish universities. Are IB students disadvantaged in any way if they're applying to Swedish universities? I don't think maybe you can use the word disadvantage, but the UHR or the governing university body did make some changes a couple of years ago, which means that you know, for certain courses, the number of IB points needed to get a place increased. That isn't, that is something that as a a collection of IB schools in Sweden, we try to influence. Mm. Uh, Of course, we're not the final decision makers. In answer to your question, Sally, it just depends on the course. There are courses that, for example, if you want to study medicine in Sweden, Mm. it, it is highly, highly, highly competitive. Right. So for an IB student, they're going to need top grades to be considered. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm using that course as one example. There are others right. that are on some of the engineering courses. So really, that's just about research, understanding the course that you're going to apply for, because it can be that demand for places makes it difficult for everyone, not just IB students. Mm, mm, yeah. No, that's true. Good. OK, thank you. No, I thought I'd just uh, throw that in at the end as well while we were chatting. Lovely. Well, Michael, thank you. It's been fantastic to speak to you today. And I think you've been so informative and I think people will learn a lot about the school. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. It's been lovely to chat to you. <laughs> yeah, you too. Thanks to Michael for a very informative interview. We really appreciate his insights. And thank you for listening. If you've got any thoughts or questions from this episode, you can find us at www.hiconnections.eu. On social media, we're on Instagram at HI Connections and on Facebook and LinkedIn, we're at Helsingborg International Connections. We'd love to hear what you think, so please get in touch. Thanks as always to the Vision Fund for their support in making this series possible.